welcome to the Neutral Ground Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Meyer. Or am I? Hmm. I'm suddenly quite skeptical of this. Hey, that reminds me, we're going to be talking a bit about postmodernism today. So where to begin? Well, as I mentioned in previous episodes, major historical movements can be somewhat difficult to define, actually. And perhaps the most difficult one is postmodernism, because it kind of resists coherency by its very nature. It's kind of like yelling at a chameleon for blending in the background. That's just kind of what it does. Nonetheless, for the sake of making sense, we're going to define it right now. Postmodernism can be boiled down to an age of skepticism. Skepticism in just about everything. You name it, it's skeptical of it. So let's try to give postmodernism some historical context here. Postmodernism arguably begins with the end of World War II, and it extends itself into, I think, the early to mid-2000s. You might be thinking to yourself, though, um, Joe, there's postmodern stuff happening right now, as we speak. And that's true, my skeptical friend. But you also have Age of Enlightenment stuff, and Romanticism stuff, and Modernism stuff as well going on. Remember, you never really fully get rid of a movement. You always keep parts of it with you. Normally the parts that are most necessary for continuing social evolution of the species. I'll talk about why I think you start to see the end of postmodernism in roughly the mid-2000s in my episode of Neomodernism. Now, I'd like to break postmodernism up into two categories for us. The first category is postmodernism as an actual theory, a framework for thinking about the unrepresentable nature of modernism and, to an extent, modernity itself. And yes, those are two separate things, as I spoke about in an earlier episode. The second category has to do with postmodernism as a form of pop cultural representation, with all due respect to Derrida, Lacan, and Monsieur François Lyotard, it is this second category of postmodernism, this pop cultural representation, that I think is most likely to survive and continue propagating into the future. Although I will defend some utility for the first category as well in this episode. Ultimately, I'm going to break these two parts of postmodernism up into two separate episodes of the podcast because these ideas are really quite large and sticky, and because I'm likely going to need a nap after this one. A very long nap. So let's dive into the first category. Postmodernism as a theoretical framework for attempting to represent the unrepresentable while resisting the declaration of meaning. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff that I remember from grad school. Before we begin, I want to make two things clear about this first part of the discussion as well. First, if you find yourself getting lost in the language, just act like a typical graduate student. Nod and make some kind of profound grunting noise. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. Even if no one is around to hear it but yourself, that will automatically put you three credits closer to getting your PhD. Second, Postmodern theories often resist definition and meaning by their definitions. Therefore, I will do my best to make it as graspable and utilitarian as possible. However, there's so much information between the various approaches to postmodern theories that there is really no way that I can hit upon all of them in this podcast. So if I don't get to your favorite postmodern theorist or rock star theory, forgive me. As a bonus third point, did I mention that my PhD is in early American literature? Yeah, that will become apparent pretty quickly as we break this stuff down. Let's start with one of the more difficult authors, Jacques Lacan. Lacan's intellectual framework resides in really kind of both modernism and postmodernism. Dude lived a long time, like 1901 to like 1981 or something. So he has developed thoughts and theories that span both modernism and postmodernism. This is actually kind of important because proper postmodern theory 
really is kind of predicated on an interaction with modernist ideas. In the case of Lacan, he was really fascinated with Freud and psychoanalysis. So one of the many theories proposed by Lacan has to do with differentiating drive and desire. We tend to think of drive and desire as being linked together in a kind of a positive manner. And you know, some, to some degree, I think some people tend to even almost look at them as synonyms. And of course, I think many of us would push back against that. But for Lacan, he saw this kind of positive connection between drive and desire as being much more negative than I think many of us do. For the purpose of this you know, dif- difficult language that we have to wade through, I'm going to be relying quite heavily on Stanford's Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which, if you are interested, is a phenomenal resource for philosophy. They do a great job of putting things as succinctly and, and comprehensible as possible. So I'm going to be taking from those pages for this postmodern section of the podcast here. And on the Lacan page, it states, An essential characteristic of desire is its restlessness, its ongoing agitated searching and futile striving. No object it gets its hands on is ever quite it. Whereas desire is stuck with its dissatisfied drifting from object to object and ever onward, in a structured movement akin to the spurious slash bad infinite as per Hegel. Drive derives a perverse enjoyment from this desire-fueled libidinal circling around the vanishing point of the impossible qua unattainable. There, where desire is frustrated, drive is gratified. Drive gains its satisfaction through vampirically feeding off of the dissatisfaction of desire. Ah, it's not a postmodern party until someone drops a qua. So what does this actually mean here? Well, it's actually quite fascinating what's going on here. And I think we can also make this fit a bit into our own psyches today and make it work, you know, so that we have a better comprehension of it. What Lacan is essentially saying is desire is predicated on the idea of the the searching for the object. But even if we get that object, it's never really it. It's never really the object. Nothing about the object actually even necessarily satisfies the desire. We just continually are stuck in desire. Think for a second about the smartphone kind of phenomena that we still have even today. Many times people will buy their smartphone, and then when Apple or Samsung or whomever it is that you you know use, we'll use Apple just because I think that's an easier example here. When Apple comes out and says, we have a new phone. It, it's got this and this and this. It immediately creates, again, this idea of desire. And in our minds, in our consumer-driven minds, we desire that object, or at least we think we desire that object. And when we do actually buy that object or get a hold of it, think for yourself for a second. How many times have you desired something You have it in your possession, and it's not as if it really creates that big of a difference in your life. Did it really satisfy the desire? Really? No, because in actuality, as soon as that next phone comes out, we desire that one. And that's what Lacan means by we just sort of move from one object to the other, right? Desire is stuck with its dissatisfied drifting from object to object. That's what essentially we do in this environment. Whereas drive takes a kind of, and I love this idea of a vampiric feeding off of the dissatisfaction of desire. We, we still have that satisfaction feeling that we don't get from actually obtaining the object and drive feeds off of that dissatisfaction. So what's the utility in this for us? It is, I think, important, or it can be important to differentiate between drive and desire. 
And what Lacan does here is he does give us language from which to maybe better or more accurately think about where we might be stuck in certain situations. Are we typically stuck in desire, just kind of drifting from object to object, or are we stuck even in drive, where we're just feeding off of that desire only? Neither one is really particularly good, even if drive may sound a little bit better than just moving from object to object, neither one is particularly good. So if you can identify which one you're more likely stuck in, I think you have a better chance of disconnecting yourself from that particular one. Okay, what about art, however? What role does art play in all of this? Again, proper postmodern theory, at least the kind that everyone seems to hate so much today, is connected to modernism itself. How does it relate to modernism? Well, let's go again to Stanford's Encyclopedia of Philosophy here for some language that we can then kind of break apart. These ideas come from the mind of Francois Lyotard. Quote, Modern art is emblematic of a sublime sensibility, that is, a sensibility that there is something non-presentable demanding to be put into sensible form, and yet overwhelms all attempts to do so. But where modern art presents the unpresentable as a missing content within a beautiful form, as in Marcel Proust, postmodern art, exemplified by James Joyce, puts forward the unpresentable by foregoing beautiful form itself, thus denying what Kant would call the consensus of taste. Furthermore, says Lyotard, a work can become modern only if it is first postmodern, for postmodernism is not modernism at its end, but in its nascent state, that is, at the moment it attempts to present the unpresentable, and this state is constant. The postmodern, then, is a repetition of the modern as the new, and this means the ever-new demand for another repetition. That's a lot to kind of take in here. To break it down, really, what we need to kind of just think is it's almost as if postmodernism is, in a sense, a precursor to modernism. Now, in terms of our historical and chronological timeline, that doesn't really make much sense. But what I think you're going to find, at least by the end of this episode and probably by the end of the next episode as well, you're going to understand, I think, what Leo Tard is trying to say here which is that post postmodern thinking in some ways sets up the under our understanding of modernism itself. And if you recall from my previous episode where I talked about modernism, if you hadn't listened to that episode, you might want to listen to that episode first here so that you can get a, a good grasp of modernism, because then I think all of this is going to connect uh, quite well in the end. But what I find fascinating about this too, one, I think the thinking exercise of it alone is, is interesting enough for me. The idea that postmodernism in some way is kind of a precursor to modernism. That's just fascinating to look back at something like that. But I think this idea also further scaffolds my argument that we are in neo-modernism right now. Because in a lot of ways, these postmodern theorists were right in that the postmodern structure of thinking has created a kind of reemergence of modernist thought, right? Think about the fracturing effect of it because of the ways in which postmodernism kind of presupposes the decline of hierarchies and structures, you know, that distrust in structures that we see. And what about literature and language? Well, Come on, you knew we were going to have to hit up the Godfather himself. The man who needs no introduction, because he would have just denied that it signifies any relation to his subjective self. If he were a Transformer, he'd be a Deconstructicon. Jock, don't call me a postmodernist. Derrida. According to Stanford's philosophy page on Derrida, 
postmodern sensibility does not lament the loss of narrative coherence any more than the loss of being. However, the dissolution of narrative leaves the field of legitimation to a new unifying criterion, the performativity of the knowledge-producing system whose form of capital is information. Well, that's what I've been trying to say all along. <laughs> I mean, was that so difficult to understand? And you were worried that you wouldn't be able to keep up. Don't you feel silly now? Hmm? What was that? What does it mean? Oh, you mean you want me to explain it? Um, sure. Yeah, of course I can. I mean, come on, I have a PhD in literature. I took courses in grad school on this stuff. So, um, yeah, let me just, uh, adjust my, um, microphone here a second and, um, take another look. Wait, I think I hear my wife calling me. I, no? Oh, she's saying I'm on my own here. Okay, um, <clears throat> all right. You can do this. Basically, the point is that forget about the meaning of the text. It's not really there. What is there is the system by which the text attempts to construct an a priori meaning of itself, only to reveal that there are secondary reference points within the text that actually propose alternate meanings, ones that supplant the initial proposed dominant meaning, revealing complex layers of meaning that work in conjunction with the dominant narrative, while at the same time supplanting it. Boom. Pulled that one out. In all seriousness... Derrida's point about language and text here is that when you deconstruct the text, you can identify what the text attempts to show, but through deconstruction, you find alternate ways of viewing the text that can sometimes support or even destroy that initial one-dimensional interpretation that the text tries to give you. The structure of the text itself is usually the thing that reveals this, which is why you need to pay careful attention to how the structure of the language tries to both prioritize and hide meaning at the same time. So let's think about a text for a moment. Let's talk about Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea. It's a fairly simple narrative about an old man named Santiago who goes out fishing, hooks a marlin, and then persists in a great battle to bring that marlin in. The fish is so big, he has to tie it to his boat. But as he takes his boat back to the dock, the man finds himself in a new battle, trying to keep the sharks from eating it. Spoiler alert, it doesn't really work out well for the marlin. Now, a straightforward interpretation might look at the story from a man versus nature reading, or even a man versus, you know, man. Or it could look at how life is a series of intense battles with less than ideal endings and how we interpret those endings, seeing them as character building or character destroying, is what we need to take away from it or what we need to focus on. A deconstructive reading might read the text to see how its structure subverts these readings and draws our attention to other meanings. For example, there is a young man, an apprentice in the story named Manolin. A deconstructive reading might ask, how does the text deny Manolin, his epic battle, his right at being tested by battle, and what does this potentially do for how he confronts conflict? You would then look at the language of the text, the interactions between the old man, Santiago, and Manolin, and try to see how the language reveals this. Now, how is this useful for us? Well, oftentimes, when we kind of construct our day, we construct it almost like a story or construct our lives like a story, even if we're not fully conscious of it. And when we construct our story, we tend to put ourselves as the lead actor, right? Or actress. And in doing so, we can sometimes not really give thought to how the other people in our story work how their lives interact with our own. We might call this being selfish. We might call this being egotistical. But still, nonetheless, there are times when we, we aren't fully aware of, what, of how other people are functioning 
within our story. Even the idea that we, again, the, the postmodernists would say, you structure your tale, your life, and put that dominant narrative of meaning behind the subjective self, right? I am the story. I am the lead actor. And in doing so, or I should say, I'll say it this way. When we deconstruct that, though, we see how other parts of the narrative, we can focus on those other parts, and in doing so, they can convey meaning to us that is just as important as that initial one we tried to put forward of ourselves. So, for example, by deconstructing our lives and moving that dominant narrative of meaning aside, we can possibly better connect with how others function in our lives. We can better connect with their tales, and we can even put their stories as dominant, and in doing so, learn how, how to better interact with other individuals, how to be more empathetic and sympathetic with them. So there is some utility to that. And, and you might think, wow, that was a long way around to say, think of others. Well, yeah, actually, sometimes postmodern theory is kind of, I think, a long way around. But it, it gives us at least language and it gives us a theory by which to study these ideas. Let's take a look at another text, actually, and to give us kind of another example here of how language can, can kind of reveal these other ideas to us. We're going to take a brief look at an exchange from a commonly known play in postmodernism, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Now, if you've never read it, it's definitely worth a read. However, I think it's more enjoyable if you go into it understanding some of the concepts that we've discussed already, the skepticism of language, of meaning, the deconstructing of the main idea in order to generate new meanings of the text. Now, Beckett composed his play in 1948-1949, but it was first put into performance in 1953. It's about two men, Vladimir and Estragon, who are waiting for someone to arrive. That's right, Godot. While they're waiting, they have some meaningful and seemingly disjointed discussions. Here's one exchange early on in the play between the two. And rather than me say like, Estrigan, blank, Vladimir, blank, I'm just going to read it. It's basically just a one-line back and forth kind of thing here. So just assume that these are just one lines back and forth. So we'll begin with Estrigan here. Charming spot. Inspiring prospects. Let's go. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for Godot. Ah. You're sure it was here? What? That we were to wait. He said by the tree. They both look at the tree. Do you see any others? What is it? I don't know, a willow? Where are the leaves? It must be dead. No more weeping. Or perhaps it's not the season. Looks to me more like a bush. A shrub. A bush. What are you insinuating? That we've come to the wrong place? He should be here. He didn't say for sure he'd come. And if he doesn't come, we'll come back tomorrow. And then the day after tomorrow. Possibly. Now you might be thinking to yourselves, Okay, nothing happened. But think about the language for a second and break down the meaning that occurs in their seemingly disjointed exchanges. Godot says to meet by the tree. Okay, that in itself is problematic in that a tree has many forms and are not always easily distinguished from each other. Then the two men discuss that the tree looks like a bush or a shrub. If it's not a tree, but a bush, or a shrub, then this can't be the right place, right? Godot said meet at the tree. You're starting to see how the author is deconstructing meaning here. Is the tree a tree because Godot said it was the meeting place? Or is it really a shrub or a bush that has been renamed a tree by Godot? Does Godot assert 
you know, some kind of power over the plant by naming it correctly or incorrectly? Finally, think about the dimensions that are necessary for meeting someone. It makes me laugh because Neil deGrasse Tyson always talks about this in his like podcasts and stuff like that. He talks about the important dimensions of meeting. Meeting someone requires at least two dimensions. We need place and time. You can't just tell someone, meet me at at a tree. They'll naturally ask, okay, when? And you can't really just say, meet me at 5 p.m. The other person's going to say, okay, where? We know the place, right? Here, it's the tree or the shrub. But what about time? Estrogen asks, and if Godot doesn't come? To which Vladimir replies, we'll come back tomorrow. And then Estrogen says, and then the day after tomorrow. It's as if neither man is aware of the necessity of time here. They'll keep coming back to the spot as if all time is equal, as if their mere existence in the spot is the only moment at which Godot can possibly arrive. Now, I've had students tell me that they came to my office at 11.30 a.m. and that I wasn't there. I tell them, well, I was teaching another class. And they still give me this bewildered look like, Why weren't you there when I decided that you needed to be there? These students are waiting for Godot, or waiting for Gajo, as it were. This might seem like nonsense, but in actuality there is something to be said for studying how our minds can create spaces of reality where we really do feel like we construct all meaning in all things, almost like we are writing the code for the matrix we live in which means that anything that seems like it doesn't fit the code we've written for it just becomes something utterly alien to us and can really kind of create a a narrative breach in our minds, right? Like that student thinking, why weren't you there? (laughs) It's like, well, because I'm autonomous. (laughs) I, I have other places to be than where you've written me to be. All right. So, Let's bring this all onto the neutral ground for a moment, what we've discussed, right? Like, what the heck do we do with all of this in terms of its utility for the everyday person? Let's start with the positives here. Postmodern theory can actually be quite useful in controlled moderation to help see how the way that we build structures and infrastructures can potentially become problematic or even tyrannical, which is something that in democracy we always have to be careful of. In other words, we can see potentially or we can see potentiality and then course correct if need be earlier on maybe than usual. That's actually really useful because trying to build the plane while you're flying it is not really recommended by anyone. Additionally, although the language of postmodern theory is incredibly obtuse, and at times it's look, it's just downright obfuscating, right? It just like purposefully hides its meaning. The fact that it can force us to rethink the fullness of meaning behind words and thoughts, right? Think back again to Lacan's theory of desire versus drive. That can actually help us more accurately explain to others how we're particularly feeling. And it can also lead to better and more accurate communications of thoughts and emotions, I think, with with overall society in general. The more accurate we are or can be with communication, I think the healthier we can be as a society. Now, on the negative side, there are times when postmodern theorists reduce concepts and ideas to a point of what seems to be almost a complete lack of utility, like an infinite of nothingness that seems to serve no real purpose. You can be skeptical of language and you can cut apart the meaning of a text, but in doing so, you do run the risk of bastardizing meaning. And I don't just mean the author's intentions, which can absolutely be up for interpretation at times. I mean, you can destroy meaning itself. Stories have been a part of the human experience for probably as long as conscious human beings have been around. We use meaning in stories to help propagate both history and culture, and that's 
even collective histories and cultures. However, when you abolish meaning and you destabilize the self so much that it can no longer recognize itself and function in society, you do run the risk of further fracturing the human species into even more tribal entities with as much you know, connection to each other as like tigers have with lions. It's like, yeah, they're both large cats, but they're vastly different from each other and don't really overlap much for good reasons. In this sense, Leotard is right in, to a degree that postmodernism, in a strange way, is a kind of precursor to modernism, because it has this same effect of reducing, I think, the sacredness of meaning, or even any sense of a collective cultural sense of, of beauty, ideals, and even potentially humanity itself. Which is why I think today we're so very negative on postmodernism, because we're seeing, or we're living, that transition that Leotard was talking about, the transitioning from the precursor to modernism into the actual fracturing itself of neo-modernism. And so we're longing, once again, like we did in modernism, for some kind of unification or reunification, I should say, of meaning. Whew. Well, I think that's enough for this episode. Although we're still going to talk about postmodernism in the next episode, I promise it won't be nearly as thick as this one was. We're going to do a lot more with texts as well, and we'll start to bring in some popular culture here also. I thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you did enjoy the episode, please consider supporting my endeavor by leaving a positive rating, a kind comment, and or subscribing to the podcast on whichever platform you're currently using to listen to me on now. Additionally, you can find me on joemeyer.substack.com and on the neutralgroundpodcast.com, where you can listen to the episodes and contact me with a question or a comment via email. And you can even leave an audio comment with some thoughts of your own. Make them neutral ground. If your comment is particularly thoughtful and can spark some good thought in us, I'll use it on the show and we'll grapple with it together. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on the neutral ground and have a great day.